Greetings and welcome to St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. My name is Reverend Robert and I'm one of the associate priests here at St. Barnabas. It is my privilege to welcome you to worship today. You will find below this video the bulletin for our service as well as announcements of our community and I invite you to take a look at those and see what might speak to you. During this time of worship, I invite you to experience it as fully as you wish. Maybe that means that you're sitting with your favorite cup of coffee. Maybe that means that you're singing the hymns. I invite you to do all that is necessary for you to have a profound experience of the welcome of God. And now, let us worship.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders, he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the second letter of Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them and saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until the Son of Humanity has been raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He replied, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Humanity is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. When they came to the crowd, a man came to him, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? 
How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? The Gospel of our Lord. and tender, fierce mercy. I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your Spirit, and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. So this morning, the last Sunday of the Epiphany, we have the story of the Transfiguration. It's always the story for the last Sunday of Epiphany because it it is an epiphany of Jesus, a manifestation, an unveiling, a revealing of Jesus, and perhaps the quintessential story of the manifestation of Jesus. In fact, it's It's such an important story, we get it twice every year. We'll we'll hear it again on the Feast of the Transfiguration in August. And so for 30-some-odd or so years, we've come come to this text twice a year, and I've preached it many times. And it is a story that is multivalent. There's many layers and and many themes, and uh, it's a very, very rich story. And I promise not to try to do all of that this morning. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Always the challenge of the preacher is first to be present to the text, and then to build the bridge from the text to now. That's what we call homiletics, through the homiletical bridge. And so one of, the, one of the realities of a story like the Transfiguration is it has the capacity to speak into the present. So all these 30 years, I've been with this story. Each year, the story's the same, but I'm different. And my circumstances are different. And so the story has the capacity to speak to me where I am, and then part of my challenge is to try to open that for all of us. And so I found the story speaking profoundly to the theme you've heard me preach a lot lately, the theme of listening, and the theme of how we can be the peaceful presence in such a troubled, divided, divisive world. So it's my hope to open us to that in a, in a fresh way this morning. Interestingly, when, the, when we have the end of the transfiguration, by the way, just before the transfiguration, Jesus predicts his passion. Immediately following the transfiguration, we have the story of Jesus healing an epileptic boy. Immediately following that is again his prediction of his passion. So, The transfiguration is sandwiched by the passion of Jesus. But before we get to that, we get to this story of Jesus healing the epileptic boy. And it's a a quandary to me that the lectionary ends with the disciples asking the question, why could we not cast it out? 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Some people are going, yeah, what, 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 what? So Jesus, interestingly, uh, Jesus gets asked a lot of questions. He hardly ever answers them directly. He either avoids them or he answers a question with a question or he answers with an enigmatic statement, a paradoxical statement. In this case, he answers directly and with a paradoxical statement. His direct answer is, you could not cast it out because of the littleness of your faith. And that's, the littleness of your faith is one word in the Greek, and Matthew uses it several times. It becomes a theme in Matthew's gospel. Oh, ye of little faith, Jesus will say. So he says that, and then he said, an enigmatic statement, if you had faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be moved, and it would be moved. Anybody moved mountains lately? <laughs> so it's an enigmatic statement. What, 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 what could it actually mean then to have even a little bit of faith? And then I want to, again, I want to, I want us to move away from over-literalism and imagine what would it mean to come down from the mountain with Jesus and be a healing presence in the world. Isn't that what's happening? They come down from the mountain and Jesus is a healer. He's a healing presence in the world. What would it mean for us to be that kind of a people? So, again, I'm just going to do this briefly because there's so much in the transfiguration story, but, but Jesus takes them up the mountain, Peter, James, and John. See them as a model for all of us. They go up the mountain. There's a journey up, and then he is revealed to them. See it as a, as, as a picture of we're always on a journey, and what we're searching for is to connect with Jesus. To meet him in some way. To have him revealed to us. And interesting, I love it. I mean, the, the theme I really want to come back to is when the voice speaks from heaven, this is my beloved, this is my son, my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. What does it mean to listen to Jesus? Now, interestingly, because of the epiphany they, and the cloud, they fall on the ground silent. All of that's rich. A cloud comes and they fall on the ground in silence. And Jesus speaks to them. Stand up. Do not be afraid. And he touches them. May I touch you? And he touches them. That's what we all need. I need Jesus to say to me, do not be afraid. Rise. And I need him to touch me. Then, then, I'm prepared to come down the mountain, empowered by Jesus, to be a healing presence in the world. Yes? Yes. And without that, I am afraid. And I'm all about me. And I'm in distress. And I'm not capable of being present in a world that needs a healing presence. So, as I reflected on the story and what it would mean to hear Jesus, to listen to him and hear him, I, you know, I, I was saying my prayers and saying, how do I hear you? And of course, for me, I hear Jesus in the scriptures, but beyond that, how do I hear you in daily life? And where do I see you? And where do I hear you? And I was mulling that over. And, and, and the question flipped for me. What word are you listening for? Not where and how, but what? And immediately it just rolled out for me. And the first word I heard was creation.
I'd never heard that before from in, this, in, this, in this way of, of listening for Jesus. And I heard that from the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was toward God, and the face-to-face gaze, and the Word was God, and all things came to be through the Word, and all things are held together in the Word, and nothing exists apart from the Word. And I heard, oh my goodness, everything belongs, and everyone belongs, all are Jesus' creation. The one word of creation is the first word. God speaks through Jesus. The first word of Jesus is the creation. And in the Genesis story, after we hear the story, God says it's all very good. And so I began to ponder what it means to be a presence that affirms the existence of everyone I meet. They are Jesus' beloved creation. He created them, sustains them, nurtures them, and they exist in Him. St. Paul does a little meditation a couple of times, and I've often wondered if he's doing it on John 1, and he says, all things are held together in Christ. All things are being recreated in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth, all things are being made well. And so I just, it, that's, that's how Jesus sees and loves the world he has created. So you say, no, no, what, what exactly does this mean? Well, it means when you're in a conversation and the person is being, a, in your opinion, a jerk, can you love them? <laughs> can you affirm them? And when they are disagreeing with you and when they... They disagree significantly with you. And you think they're way off. Can you simply say, yes, you have the right to exist? Be with me now. Yes, you have the right to exist. So, um... I'm going to do something with my wife she doesn't know. If I had told her I was going to do this, she would have been nervous from the moment I told her till now. And so, sweetie, can you come out, please? Oh, my God, there it is, see? I need you to help me just a little bit, okay? Breathe. (laughs) So, um, the second word I heard was incarnation. Incarnation. And I want to model for you how I understand the incarnation. I understand the incarnation to be, to be Jesus saying, you can hug me, it's okay. <laughs> you are mine. I love you. I'm one with you. I sh- I'm in solidarity with you. You are mine. Incarnation. Thank you. I promise not to do it again. (laughs) Can we see the other like that? Especially when they're in pain. Can we understand that they're in pain? And by the way, the whole world is in a place. It feels like everywhere I look, people are pontificating, Broadcasting and advocating. Tell me yes. yes. Tell me no if you think no. Yes. I don't hear, thank you. I don't hear, I mean, everywhere I look, they're, they're in pain and they're just, they're, nobody's listening. They're just broadcasting, advocating, and pontificating. And by the way, there's a place for that. Preaching is pontificating, there is a place for it. <laughs> and Where's the place for listening? To to grasp all of that is coming from pain. And perhaps trauma and confusion and great fear. What does it mean to learn to be a healing presence in the midst of that? 
and metaphorically to throw your arms around them and say, you have every right to be in your pain. I'm not going to argue with you about your pain. Tell me more. Learn to ask. I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to understand better about that. Could we have a cup of coffee? And the goal is just to listen. And by the way, I know listening is more difficult than we think, but the starting place is simply ask questions. Ask questions. And by the way, when they say the offensive things, and they will, if not this conversation, the next person will, learn to pause. Hmm. Pause. By the way, research says it takes the brain seven seconds to catch up. So when they say something that lands in your heart, it's painful, it's harmful, it's hurtful, just pause. Give it seven seconds. Understand that's pain. Likely it's pain. And then say, I'd like to hear more about that. I understand the incarnation to be Jesus throwing his arms around every human being and all of their sin and all of their incompleteness and all of their confusion and their pain. I understand Jesus saying, I'm here to be with you, to be for you, to hold you. And then the third word I heard was cross. The cross of Jesus. I heard him say he's gone to the cross for the whole creation and for the whole human family. And I heard an invitation. Can I do that? So in addition to wanting to be present to a person and hear them, to do that requires setting aside my pain and my opinion and my perspective and my beliefs to set them aside. By the way, you can always go back and get them. And in another context, you can advocate, and if you need to, you can broadcast, and if you need to, you can pontificate. But especially, you can advocate. There are places for that. It's not bad. The question is, can we find our way to listen and be a healing presence to a world in so much pain, in so much acrimony, in so much divisiveness? And so every time I set aside my pain and my challenge and my perspective, every time it's like picking up my cross. And when people are ugly in what they do, and it really means bearing their persecution, it's fulfilling the final beatitude. And it's exactly what Jesus does from the cross. He takes the hostility of the world upon himself and doesn't retaliate, but goes to his death for it. To remove it and take it away. Now I'm not suggesting we all die. I'm just suggesting we lay our life down to follow Jesus' model. Of what it means to be a healing presence. You've heard the phrase, be the change. Become the change you seek. Can I, can, can, come on, we, we, yes, I, oh, thank you, yes, all right. How many of you heard that originated with, with Gandhi? How many of you heard it originated with Gandhi? That, that's what I heard, that's what I thought. And then I did some research. That great scholarly resource, Google, right? <laughs> and what I could find, by the way, the quote the phrase is derived from this statement from Gandhi, which I think is much fuller and more powerful. The original statement. By the way, according to Google. So, we 
but mirror the world. All the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. Remember, from the creation and the incarnation, we're all interrelated and connected. That's our narrative. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a person changes their own nature, so does the attitude of the world change toward them. Now that's just a slightly further nuance. This isn't the first time I've done what I'm going to do, so some of you heard me do this. Can you change people? Everybody says no. And then I, some of you heard me say, okay, I get it. You can't change people. Can you change how you respond to people, how you are with people? Everybody says yes. And I say, does that matter how they respond to you? And people go, hmm. (laughs) Hmm. As a person changes their own nature, so does the attitude of the world change toward them. So the change begins with me. Does it matter if I become a listening, affirming, not that I agree, but that I affirm you have the right to exist and you have the right to feel your pain, and you have the right to express it however you feel the need to express it. Now, by the way, I don't mean extremes in violence and things like that, barring kind of ridiculous extremes. You have the right to express yourself. And let me ask you something. When somebody has offered that to you, does it contribute to healing for you? Gandhi goes on, this is the divine mystery supreme. And I would say because we're all interconnected. A wonderful thing it is and the source of our happiness. We need not wait to see what others do. We can just be a loving, affirming healing presence in the midst of a deeply hurting world. Three words from Jesus. Creation, incarnation, cross. Amen. Please stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and the kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may stand, kneel, or be seated as we pray. Let us pray to God through Christ, our light and life saying, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the people of this land and all nations, that we may walk in the ways of justice and peace. We pray especially for Jennifer, our bishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, Joe, our president, and Katie, our governor. In your mercy. For the church gathered in this place, that we might make known the good news of God's presence in our world. In your mercy. For those lost in prejudice, hostility, and fear, and for all our brothers and sisters in any need or trouble, that God's light and life might gladden their hearts this day. In your mercy. For those whose lives are closely linked with ours, we remember particularly the Tonto Apache tribe of this land. In your mercy. For the homeless and for refugees, for prisoners and for those in the midst of poverty and pain, that they may be comforted, relieved, and protected. In your mercy. For the sick, we pray especially for Shirley, Vani, Deborah, Keba, Amy, Marquita, Thomas, Avery, Dave, Michael, Aaron, Alex, Jackie, Katie, Peter, Nico, Nell, Keith, Clark, Carolee, Ken, Lisa, Ramona, Neil, Brad, John, Hillary, Margaret, Todd, Joyce, Annette, Susan, Danny, Doug, Alice, Bobby, Jerry, McLennan, Marilyn, Brian, Michael, Michael, Linda, Sally, Marty, Todd, Sarah, Dino, Aaron, Samuel, Pat, Jan, Phil, Jerry, Allie, Barbara, Penny, Jerry, David, Pat, Frank. Including Leela Schultz and William Schultz. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, 
including Leila Schultz and William Schultz, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise as you are able. Beloved, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Share a sign of peace with one another. Good morning, or yeah, good morning. I'm sorry, I'm having a little moment here. <laughs> uh, yesterday we had a wonderful Absalom Jones service and I knew I was gonna say good morning in the afternoon and I just then I started to say good afternoon in the morning. So anyway, yeah, it's, I'm Jim Clark and it's my pleasure to welcome you to St. Barnabas this morning. If you're a guest, thank you for joining us. We want our guests to know that we invite you to participate fully in our service. So in just a few moments, we will be receiving Holy Communion and all are heartily welcome to come forward and join us. Also, following the service, we have refreshments across the patio this way in our parish hall and we invite you to come there and let us get introduced. Also, if you're interested in knowing more about St. Barnabas, we'd very much like the chance to get to know more about you. So there should be a guest card in the pew rack in front of you. You can fill that out and either place it in the alms basin or give it to us on your way out of church and that will give us information to be in touch with you in, in the coming days. Thank you again for joining us. So we have a custom at St. Barnabas of praying with people who have birthdays or anniversaries or other special times of Thanksgiving. If that's you, would you please stand? Let us pray with you. Anniversary. Anniversary in the choir, Mark and Susan. Good. Congratulations. All right. I invite all to join us in a spirit of prayer, and I invite our online worshipers to join us as well. Oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor on these your children as they begin another year and these that begin another year together. Grant that they might grow in wisdom and grace. Strengthen their trust in you and your goodness now and all the days of their lives. And in these coming days, Lord Jesus, grant them grace to find their way to you up the mountain. 
to hear you invite them to not be afraid and to feel you touch them and then to join you in being a healing presence in a hurting world. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 So would you do me a favor, please, and pull out your newsletter. I want to direct your attention on the front. It, it lets us know that this Wednesday is, is Ash Wednesday and gives you the schedule for Ash Wednesday services and program as well. We're starting our Lenten program on Thursday night. All about how the Episcopal way of following Jesus strengthens us and prepares us and equips us to be Jesus' disciples. By the way, how many of you have heard of the three-legged stool? Awesome. How many of you heard of the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral? See, you have something to learn. Okay. How many of you heard of the Via Media, the middle way in the Episcopal Church? Okay. How many of you have heard of the Adiaphora? So you, yeah, you that's, yeah, that's a retired priest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you need to come join us and learn about the ways that the Episcopal Church strengthens us as disciples of Jesus. I think this will be a wonderful Lenten program. Then on Sunday mornings, we carry on with Becoming Beloved Community, our journey to Beloved Community. I, I highly commend that. We do that both in person and on Zoom, Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. If you turn your newsletter over this Friday, we have a, a Vespers Teze service. Teze is a wonderful uh, meditative worship service. Uh, we did this several years ago, but we haven't done it for a good while at St. Barnabas. I, I commend that to you. Uh, and then I want you to notice down below, we're still really looking forward to the James Finley event at St. Barnabas. So other, other things to, to notice in our newsletter. And Susie Parker wants to come talk to us about United Think Offering. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. So today we are collecting So today we are collecting envelopes and boxes for the United Thank Offering that we initially distributed back in November. And this is a wonderful program of the Episcopal Church. And it's a way of, number one, raising money that goes um, out into the world, uh, funds go worldwide, um, but sometimes they stay in our own diocese. And a few years ago, funds that were granted from the United Thank Offering Foundation went to help small churches who didn't have the means to live stream their services once we couldn't worship in person. So it's, it's helped us in our own backyard. And the, the thing that I think is most wonderful about this is it affords us an opportunity ourselves and to teach our children ways that we can Praise God for the blessings, large and small, that we have every day in our lives, and in doing so, make a small monetary donation to our little blue box or our blue envelope. So what, what we're asking of you is if you've collected that in the past couple of months, if you'll bring your offering into the basket when you come up for, to the communion reel, that would be wonderful. If this passed you by this time, we have more envelopes and boxes in the narthex on the credenzas back there, and we will have another in-gathering um, offering, bringing our boxes and our envelopes together in May. And look for more information on that and reminders for you. So if you didn't catch it this time, there's another opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. Thank you very much. So I mentioned earlier that we had the Absalom Jones service uh, yesterday afternoon. It was just a delightful service. We had People are attending from all over the diocese. We did this in partnership with the Union of Black Episcopalians. We just had a wonderful event. And um, the preacher, the Reverend Vanessa McKenzie from the Diocese of Los Angeles, uh, said from the pulpit that we were a welcoming place. How's that sound? 
That's sweet, isn't it? She said we, she could feel it. I think three times she came to me and said, Jim, I feel the genuine hospitality and welcome of this community. I, from the moment I entered, I felt it, and it's, it's real, and I just want to thank you and, and celebrate. And so I need to pass that on to you, because that's a celebration of us and, and who we are, and it's a wonderful thing. And we want to carry that on right out into the world, which, was, which is at the heart of my sermon. So can you say amen? amen. Isn't that sweet? It's wonderful. All right. And then I want to say thank you to all the folks that made that possible. Lots of members of St. Barnabas participated. Our, our choir and musicians were there and just spectacular. And it was just Kate Fembrays and her team put on a beautiful reception in the parish hall. And, and uh, we had our liturgical coordinators and readers and ushers. And it's just this magnificent thing. Could you join me in saying thank you to all the folks that made it? It's just wonderful. And we're, esta we're establishing some wonderful friendships and partnerships with the Union of Black Episcopalians, and that's just a great thing for all of us. So it's just, it's all good. It's all good. So... We often say, remember the words of the scripture, to walk in love as Christ loved us. To walk in the love of creation, the love of incarnation, and the love of the cross. Let us indeed walk in love as Christ loves us. Amen.
With you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Remain standing, kneel, or be seated as we pray. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, 
and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. They are holy gifts for you, God's holy people.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, with grateful hearts we give thanks for the blessings and challenges that inspire the work of the United Thank Offering. May the offerings given to the UTO as an expression of gratitude go on to address the needs of our ever-changing world. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, whose example we strive to follow. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.